North Koreans are abducted at birth, so they don't know the concepts of freedom or human rights. They don't know that they are slaves. North Korea is a country filled with mystery, isolation, and secrecy. It tightly regulates almost every aspect of its citizens' life. It is known peculiarly for the rules and bizarre happenings. From a city filled with a perplexing lifestyle to a city filled with range and camouflage. In this video, we will dive into weird things that exist only in North Korea. Number 15. The Cult of Personality and the Eternal Leaders we can't dive into the deep secrets of a great nation without first paying homage to its origin. The cult of personality and eternal leaders are the power center of North Korea. You heard that right. North Koreans live only by the rule of law and the leadership of just one family. The Kim family, of which Kim Il-sung is from, Kim Second sung in 1948, founded the country and created its own rules. North Koreans claim to be a democratic country and practice democracy every five years but does otherwise. What is democratic about voting for one person? Weird, right? Well, let's see the reason why North Koreans are hell-bent on keeping the Kim family. Let's delve into the historical roots, the mechanisms behind the cult, its impact on society, and the implications for North Korea's political landscape and international relations. At the heart of the North Korean cult of personality is the glorification and deification status of its leaders, Kim Il-sung and his son, Ki Jong il proper respect to the eternal leaders of Korea. The cult was largely shaped during Kim Il-sung's rule. Kim Il-sung used propaganda, art, and media to portray himself as a benevolent and all-powerful leader, elevating him to a godlike status, making the people hell-bent on obeying him because he became as though a god to them. His birth year even became the Yush calendar start date, signifying the country's ideological doctrine of self-reliance and is the biggest holiday in North Korea with lots of fireworks and partying. The personality cult served several purposes. Firstly, it strengthened the leader's grip on power by fostering loyalty and fear. Any form of questioning of the leader's authority was harshly suppressed. You must only obey and conform. Also, the cult often attributes all the achievements and successes of the nation to the brilliance and guidance of the leader. Number 14. No Religion This is not surprising at all, especially for a nation that sees its leaders as gods. What do they need another god for? It's a known fact that before gaining full power in 1948, Kim Second Sung was actually birthed by a Christian mother, Kang Ban Siok. He also admitted that he attended services as a child and found them boring. Maybe that's why he made sure nobody in North Korea ever got bored like he did. Due to the ideology of Juche, which promotes self-reliance and the cult of personality surrounding the ruling Kim family, the government discourages any form of organized religion and those practicing their faith face severe persecution. The regime only promotes a personality cult around its leaders, particularly Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il who are revered almost as deities. Citizens are required to participate in various rituals and ceremonies praising the leaders, and any perceived disrespect or lack of devotion is met with harsh punishments. Although some religious organizations technically exist which are not entirely known by those outside its walls, these organizations are tightly monitored and operated under the strict supervision of the state. But Christianity is a taboo, and anyone caught practicing it faces severe persecution, this is because it is associated with foreign influence and seen as a potential threat to the regime's control. Despite all these restrictions, I strongly believe there are underground religious practices and believers. I mean, humans are not robots and can be sneaky, but they must be very secretive to avoid punishment by death. Did you know? North Koreans still practice public execution, and children as young as five years old are mandatory to watch. Speaking of execution, let's see what it feels like to be punished by the North Korean government. Number 13. Three Generational Punishment Imagine, just imagine your uncle stole an apple and now everyone in the family has to go to prison for his mistakes. Maybe he apologized and returned the apple, but it doesn't count because the whole family three generations down has to go to prison. This is especially sad because aged parents and children too will be in prison serving terms for an offense you had no idea of. This is exactly what's happening in North Korea. But unlike your uncle stealing an apple, 
The three-generational prison policy applies mostly to individuals who are perceived as enemies of the state or have committed political crimes. This rule holds not only the accused person responsible for their actions, but also extends punishment to their immediate family, covering at least three generations. The origins of this policy can be traced back to the early years of the North Korean regime under Kim Il-sung. It was implemented as a means to consolidate the ruling party's power and to suppress any potential dissent or opposition. By punishing multiple generations of a family, its intention is to instill fear and discourage any thoughts of rebellion or disloyalty to the state. If an individual is accused of a political crime or is labeled as an enemy of the state, not only will they face severe punishment, but their parents, children, and even grandchildren can also be subjected to imprisonment, forced labor, or exile to remote areas. By holding multiple generations accountable, the regime aims to eradicate any potential opposition from the root, leaving no room for dissent to grow within families. This policy creates fear which prevents individuals from expressing any critical views for fear of endangering their entire family. So technically, there's no freedom of speech. Of all the rules, this policy has been criticized widely by the international community and human rights organizations for its gross violations of individual rights and its disregard for due process. It has resulted in countless innocent individuals and their families facing unimaginable suffering and hardship under the oppressive North Korean regime. But North Korea is a planet of its own, so it turned deaf ears to what Earthlings have to say. Number 12. Fake Cities It's no news that North Korea is very notorious for its secretive nature, but having cities empty and camouflaged to be real is taking it too far. Meet the city of Kijondong, filled with elaborate facades constructed to present an illusion of prosperity and success to the outside world. These fake cities are predominantly found near the country's border with South Korea, particularly in the Kaesong Industrial Region along the Korean Demilitarized Zone. One of so many cities that gained international attention is Kijondong, often referred to as the Propaganda Village. Why would a fake city gain international attention? Well, it was because it was real and perfect in every way. Kijondong is situated in the demilitarized zone and is a highly choreographed urban area, complete with eye-catching high-rise buildings and a large flagpole towering over the skyline, supposedly hosting patriotic North Koreans. You might wonder, why build such cities and waste useful funds? Well, the purpose of these fake cities is believed to be a display of prosperity and strength intended to deceive foreign observers and neighboring South Korea. By presenting a false image of affluence and development, North Korea aims to maintain its image as a formidable nation and a utopian society, even though, of course, the reality is far from it. There have been arguments about their true intentions, as some argue that the primary motivation for these deceptive facades is to project an image of strength. But reports suggest that the buildings in Kijondong lack glass windows, and some have argued that the entire village might be a mere stage set, devoid of actual residents. Still others believe they serve as a means to distract its own population from the dire economic and social conditions prevalent in the country. Because North Korea has faced severe economic challenges, including widespread poverty, food shortages, and a lack of access to basic amenities for a significant portion of its citizens. Despite these suspicions, the full truth behind these fake cities remains elusive, given the limited access to the country and the secretive nature of its government. Attempts by foreign journalists or visitors to enter these areas are tightly controlled, making it challenging to verify the claims surrounding these urban facades. Number 11. Prohibition of Blue Jeans and Western Clothing In North Korea, the prohibition of blue jeans and Western clothing is simply because Kim Jong-un sees them as American perception and influence. This prohibition extends to imported garments and t-shirts. Citizens are expected to wear clothing that adheres to the state-approved guidelines. Instead of jeans, North Koreans are encouraged to wear traditional Korean attire, such as hanboks, which reflects the leadership's emphasis on cultural heritage and nationalism. Enforcement of these clothing regulations is stringent, with state authorities conducting inspections and punishing those who violate the dress code. Offenders risk facing fines, public criticism, or even imprisonment. This approach to clothing control has been met with mixed reactions from the international community, 
often drawing criticism for its infringement on personal freedoms and human rights. Many people argue that the ban helps preserve a unique North Korean identity. Others view it as an oppressive measure aimed at suppressing individuality and perpetuating a culture of conformity. What do you think? The restrictions on clothing are just one example of the broader control exerted by the North Korean government over its citizens' life. Next, look at their hairstyles. Number 10. State Control Haircut When you think of North Koreans' haircuts, you immediately think of their leader, Kim Jong-un. It's a relief nobody dares cut their hair like his. Honestly, I don't think anyone wants to. In North Korea, hairstyles and grooming are subject to strict control and regulation as part of the country's cultural norms. The government enforces specific guidelines for hairstyles, with the intention of promoting conformity and projecting a particular image of the ideal citizen. These regulations extend to both men, women, and children. It requires just 28 approved haircuts with just 10 for men and 18 for women. These laws are enforced through state-run media, posters, and regular inspections by local authorities. The guidelines for men's hairstyles in North Korea generally require hair to be kept short, with specific rules regarding length, style, and even sideburns. Traditional Korean hairstyles are often preferred, with inspiration drawn from historical figures and revolutionary leaders. For instance, the Japatsu style, resembling the haircut of former leader Kim Jong-il, is considered one of the most popular and acceptable options. For women, the range of approved hairstyles is somewhat broader, but they are still required to maintain conservative appearances. Very long hair is generally not preferred, and there are specific guidelines for how to style and accessorize it. Women are encouraged to adopt hairstyles that are perceived as feminine and traditional. Local hair salons play a crucial role in enforcing these grooming rules. They must display posters with images of approved hairstyles and are obligated to follow the government's guidelines. In addition, hairdressers may be required to report any customers attempting to adopt forbidden haircuts or styles, creating an atmosphere of surveillance and fear. The enforcement of grooming regulations extends beyond haircuts. North Korean men are expected to remain clean-shaven, and facial hair is generally discouraged unless it serves a symbolic purpose, which is very rare. Women are also expected to adhere to strict grooming standards and not expose their thighs or cleavages in any way. Makeup should be moderate to maintain a modest and natural appearance. Penalties for failing to comply with the state's grooming regulations can range from fines and public shaming to more severe punishments like intense labor or even death. This depends on the severity of the violation and the political status of the individual involved. By regulating personal appearance, the regime aims to ensure that the population adheres to the state's ideals and maintains a unified national identity. This strict regulation of haircuts and grooming exemplifies the wider atmosphere of surveillance and control that permeates various aspects of life in North Korea. Number 9. The Traffic Ladies One of the first sightings tourists observe while visiting North Korea are the beautiful women dressed in elegant uniforms with distinctive white gloves and hats, gracefully controlling the traffic. North Korea's traffic ladies are a distinct and iconic feature of the country. These uniformed female officers play a crucial role in directing traffic and maintaining order on the streets. Their presence is particularly notable in Pyongyang, the capital city. These traffic are highly visible and command respect from both pedestrians and motorists. They are meticulously trained and maintain a disciplined demeanor, adhering to a strict code of conduct. Beyond their primary duties of managing traffic flow, they also act as symbols of national pride and discipline. These ladies are carefully selected for their roles, often chosen based on their physical appearance, height, and educational background. Their training involves not only learning traffic rules, they also learn communication skills and various hand signals to effectively manage the flow of vehicles. The traffic ladies were first introduced in the early 1960s as part of a broader effort to create a disciplined and orderly society. Since then, these ladies have become an enduring symbol of North Korea's unique brand of socialism and are frequently featured in state propaganda and media. No doubt, ladies represent a fascinating blend of tradition, discipline, and nationalism. 
Their elegant and distinctive appearance, coupled with their essential role in maintaining traffic order, makes them an enduring symbol of the North Koreans' unique social and political landscape. This is something other countries should emulate. Now tell us, would ladies in your country do the job of the traffic ladies effectively? Number 8. Dating in North Korea Up next, let's look into the romantic life of the North Koreans. You would be shocked by what you are about to find out. The dating life of North Koreans is absolutely different from what you have in mind. They don't go to the movies together or have any form or dating activities except from strolling on the stress with their hands to themselves. And as usual, their dating life is heavily influenced by the country's unique social and political context. The North Korean regime tightly controls the interactions between citizens, including romantic relationships. No formal dating or public displays of affection is allowed. Social gatherings are always monitored, so citizens are often cautious about engaging in romantic activities due to potential surveillance and impending punishment. North Koreans mostly follow the traditional matchmaking and arranged marriages, with consideration of social status and level of loyalty to the regime. Cross-country dating is discouraged, as the regime views relationships with foreigners as a potential security risk. So, the dating life of North Koreans remains challenging and controlled, reflecting the regime's emphasis on maintaining strict social order and ideological conformity. Number 7. No use of contraceptives and sanitarias. You have been warned this part will send spiders crawling. Ladies in North Korea don't not know what a sanitary pad is and have never seen one before, even with the invention of sanitary pads since 1888. But because of how secretive the country is, so many things might have been changed. But based on previous knowledge from ladies who were privileged enough to live in the country, they related how used cloth and towels were constantly used and washed just to be reused the next month. I find this very unhygienic and extremely irritating. We are not in the golden age anymore. Women should have the right to feel protected and clean. Number 6. No television, telephone, or internet connection. In North Korea, the strict and pervasive no television or internet connection rule has been a fundamental aspect of the government's control over information and communication. This highly restrictive policy has been in place for decades, with the aim of isolating the country from the outside world and tightly controlling the narrative presented to its citizens. The regime's decision to ban television and internet access serves several purposes. First, it enables the government to tightly control the flow of information and restricts access to external influences that may challenge the state's propaganda. By preventing citizens from accessing foreign media or the internet, the authorities maintain a tight grip on the narrative, ensuring the preservation of the state's ideology and, most importantly, keeping the leader's cult of personality intact. This rule also serves to maintain a sense of isolation and unity among the citizens. With limited access to the outside world, North Koreans are less likely to be exposed to alternative viewpoints or different ways of life. This is exactly why they are so loyal to their leader and the cult. This rule fosters a sense of loyalty and obedience to the regime. Citizens of North Korea are conditioned to believe that their leader and state are the sole providers of information and support. To ensure this rule is enforced, the government employs a sophisticated system of surveillance and censorship. Also, unauthorized possession of a television or internet-enabled device is considered a serious offense, and those caught face severe consequences, including imprisonment or even execution. Despite the isolation, there have been reports of citizens finding creative ways to access foreign media, often using smuggled devices or illegal satellite dishes. However, the risks associated with such actions are high, and discovery would lead to dire consequences. Fun fact, North Koreans cannot see this video. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. This image raises a lot of questions as it appears to be high school students practicing openly intimacy meant for married persons in their classroom. Is this how sexual education is taught in North Korea? Especially with the extreme high profile of morality they convey. If this image is real, it will affect the value promoted by North Korea. What do you think? Let us know in the comments section. Number 5. Prison Camps in North Korea We've seen how strict the rule of offense is in North Korea. 
Now let's look into the lives of those inside prisons. I bet it'll be a community there. The prison camp system in North Korea consists of several types of facilities, like the political prison camps, labor camps, and re-education centers. The political prison camps are designed for perceived political enemies of the regime, such as individuals suspected of dissent or attempting to escape the country. The conditions in these camps are extremely harsh, with prisoners subjected to forced labor, inadequate food, and medical care. Torture, physical abuse, and executions are very common. This is to further intensifying the atmosphere of fear and control. There is strict surveillance to suppress any form of dissent within the camp, too. The labor camps are another category of prison facilities, housing individuals who are considered criminals by North Korean standards, often for offenses like illegal border crossing or smuggling. These camps are often used for forced labor, with prisoners subjected to grueling and excruciating work without fair remuneration or rest. The re-education centers seems to be the best type of prison in North Korea because it is designed to rehabilitate individuals who have committed minor offenses or show signs of deviating from the state ideology. Almost like if you decide to keep your hair longer than usual and stand by it, then you might have a mental issue and need serious psychological attention. These centers employ psychological and ideological indoctrination techniques to enforce loyalty to the regime and eliminate any potential threats to its power. This form of punishment is absolutely better than the other forms. But do they really use it? Number 4. The Educational System in North Korea Do you think North Koreans practice a different style of education? One thing is certainly that North Korea's educational system is heavily controlled and centralized by the state. Education in North Korea is compulsory and free only for children aged 5 to 16, divided into three stages, primary, secondary, and higher education. Their curriculum emphasizes subjects like Korean language, mathematics, social studies, and physical education, all infused with propaganda glorifying the country's leaders and revolutionary history. Students are also taught Jush ideology from an early age, the state's official belief system promoting self-reliance, militarism, and loyalty to the ruling Kim family. The educational system is highly selective, and students are tracked and picked from an early age based on their perceived loyalty to the regime and family background. Those with relatives who are perceived as disloyal may face discrimination and limited opportunities, especially when they are in prison. Teachers are required to undergo extensive ideological training, their primary responsibility is to ensure students adhere to the government's principles and ideas. The system discourages critical thinking and encourages conformity to the established norms and beliefs. For extracurricular activities, there is an extensive network of youth and children's palaces and children's union groups, where young people participate in various extracurricular activities such as music, sports, and arts. These activities further promote loyalty to the state and reinforce the regime's ideology. Higher education is also tightly controlled, with only a select few allowed to attend prestigious universities in Pyongyang the state, while the majority attend regional institutions. Graduates are often placed in positions according to the government's needs and are expected to contribute to the regime's goals. So you can't have an ambition of your own. Your life is only for the regime. Number 3. Peculiar Time Zones and Calendars North Korea operates on its own unique time zone and calendar, which distinguishes it from the rest of the world. The country follows a system known as Pyongyang Time, PT, officially named after its capital city. Here's an explanation of the peculiar time zones and calendars in North Korea. North Korea is in a time zone that is eight hours ahead of Coordinated Universal Time, UTC plus eight. This puts it half an hour behind neighboring South Korea, Korea Standard Time, UTC plus 9, and Japan, Japan Standard Time, UTC plus 9. In August 2015, North Korea decided to shift its time zone by 30 minutes to mark the 70th anniversary of its liberation from Japanese rule. The change aimed to symbolize the country's independence from its historical ties to Japan and align its time zone with the one used before the Japanese occupation. In addition to the unique time zone, North Korea follows its own calendar system called the Juchi calendar. It was introduced in 1997 
and its starting point is the birth year of Kim Il-sung, the founding leader of North Korea. The peculiarity of North Korea's time zones and calendars reflects the country's isolationist policies and emphasis on its distinct identity. While it may cause logistical challenges for international interactions, businesses, and communication, these measures reinforce the government's control over its citizens and contribute to the regime's narrative of self-reliance and sovereignty. Number 2. The Ryugyong Hotel This is one of the biggest hostels in the world, but it only exists in North Korea. The Ryugyong Hotel in Pyongyang, North Korea, is a massive, imposing structure that has become an iconic symbol of the city's skyline. Standing at approximately 330 meters tall with 105 floors, it is one of the world's tallest unoccupied buildings. Construction began in 1987 but halted for years due to economic difficulties, earning it the nickname Hotel of Doom. Its unique design features three wings that taper upwards, resembling a stepped pyramid or a towering cone. The exterior is clad in glass and concrete, creating a strikingly futuristic appearance. Despite decades of stalled progress, the hotel underwent some refurbishments, including the addition of LED lighting, which illuminates the structure at night. The interior of the Ryugyong Hotel remains largely a mystery, with limited information available to the public. It stands as an enigmatic and controversial landmark, exemplifying the ambitious architectural projects of North Korea's regime, but has never received visitors and never been useful. Number 1. Arirang Mass Game The spectacular and mesmerizing display of act, tradition, and perfect synchronization in these games would make you want to visit North Korea. This event is held annually to celebrate the country's revolutionary history and promote patriotism among its citizens. The mass games are a combination of dance, gymnastics, music, and military display, showcasing the ideological principles of the ruling regime. The Arirang game was organized to commemorate the leaders of the Korean Workers' Party Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. Over the years, the event evolved and grew in scale, eventually becoming one of the most impressive displays of mass performances in the world. The Arirang mass games are characterized by their sheer size and precision. Thousands of performers, mostly students and members of various organizations, would participate in these performances, forming elaborate patterns and images that could be seen from miles away. These events would surely require intense training and strict discipline to achieve the desired synchronization. The event usually takes place in Pyongyang's May Day Stadium, which is the biggest stadium in the world, with a seating capacity of over 150,000 spectators. The performances are a grand spectacle of lights, color, and movement, accompanied by a carefully choreographed display of propaganda that praises the country's leaders and their achievements. Themes often revolved around North Korean history, revolutionary struggles, and the supposed virtues of socialism. The event's music is performed by a large choir singing patriotic songs and revolutionary anthems in perfect harmony. Traditional Korean folk music Instruments were also integrated into the performances, adding cultural richness to the displays. This is a good kind of wired. North Korea seems not to be a totally black hole crazy. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.